Actually, funny thing is, in September will be 10 years. Yeah, yeah, it's been that fast. Um, I remember, I'll tell in a second, but I remember the day I walked in here uh, by the wisdom of Rachel Jenks, and I was like, nope. And uh, I, I was not, I was not about it. I was, but, but I'll share a little bit of that. But I, I saw something during worship. So I was thinking about. Adam and Eve in the garden, and we all know, like, if you don't know the story, it's Adam and Eve were created by God. They told, God told them what to do. They disobeyed. They, after they disobeyed, they felt naked or unclean in some sense, and they ran. But God came back to find them where he's always found them in the cool of the day, and I I don't really know who this is for, but I want you to know that we are exposed before God. It's just how it is. It's, we're just, it's there. If, and I want to encourage whoever this is for that he doesn't run away from sin. He ran towards it. <laughs> he, he wanted a solution for it. He didn't want you to get out of it. He didn't want you to stay in it. Actually, Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden not because of punishment, but because he didn't want them to eat the tree of life and live that way forever. So it's not, it's not about, oh, well, they got punished, so they got pushed out. No, no, no. They got pushed out so that way they wouldn't live in a sinful state anymore, separate away from God and cut off. He wanted ultimately a restorative thing to come, but he had to get them away from something that was going to give them like what you would call eternal life. So... I just want to encourage whoever this is for, it's, it's okay to go towards God in darkness because it's not like he's not strong enough. And it's not like he's too, he's weak. It's not like he becomes this like weak soul when sin comes. He becomes this, okay, so we're going to give you a solution to it. And it's in Christ Jesus that he who became sin knew no sin. He was in Christ reconciling the world to himself he wasn't outside of christ wondering if jesus would be forsaken he was in christ reconciling the world to himself he he was with you in your darkness wherever you are right now he's he's in he's in you he's not he's not if there's no two dogs inside of you fighting there's no evil and good it is the nature of the seed of heaven inside of you and what it's doing right now is it's trying to inform your soul about what's true about you that's what it's trying to do it's not so god's not running away from you he's running towards you and he's running towards you in the place where you met him so whoever that's for he's going to meet you or the place where he met you so he's going to meet you there he's not going to meet you in some like curated thing that seems right he's going to meet you in the darkness that you might be experiencing in this moment so i've been here for 10 years in well september and i just wanted to like go over quickly um when did i start oh yes so much time um i want to go quickly over my like testimony a little bit and then my my time here because i know we have a lot of new people i know some of you might feel like why am I here? Like, why do I come back? <laughs> well, <laughs> welcome to the world I was in <laughs> not that long ago. <laughs> for, those who, for those who don't know, I was, I was adopted at birth, and I was delivered, actually, to my parents' house. I just learned this, like, two years ago. My parents are, like, unfolding my adoption to me <laughs> as they get older, which is really scary because they're kind of old. Like, like, my dad turns 84 this year, and I'm sitting here going, like, now you tell me this? Like, you know, this could have been nice when I was 21. So I was adopted. I was delivered to my parents' house. I, I'm originally from Long Island. And there was a lot of stuff wrong with me. And, and to keep the story short, I, I was in, like, a stasis for a while because my mother, my, my birth mother, had a bunch of problems, had, had contracted diseases, and they had to keep me away from my siblings growing up because they didn't want me to, they didn't want them to catch what I had. And 
what's wild about it is that they tested me about, I don't know, when I was two or three for AIDS, because I think my mom had HIV, and it was clean, and I sat there and I went, my parents told me that for the first time, I said, isn't, isn't birth through blood? Like, this doesn't make no sense. Like, I'm sitting here like, I'm coming out, and I should be having disease all over me, and yet I don't. And so, it's beautiful, and as I was growing up, I went to church, and I was not a good church kid, not at all. I didn't want to go, I didn't feel like going, like my dad would just like pull me out of bed and I'd be like, no, I don't want to go. And he'd be like, we're going. And I'm like, no. And I would just, I would definitely not be the, the church kid that you think I was because I definitely did not pay attention, did not sing any songs, didn't want to look at the hymnal, didn't pray when they prayed, didn't even listen to the message half the time. I was just there to appease my father. And that was it. And for a long time, that was me. And I went to ironically, in Assemblies of God Church when I was younger, didn't know it because I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> and then I moved up to Watkins Glen and I started going to this Baptist church because we, my, that's the first youth, like they had a youth group and so my dad wanted me to go there. And there, I could say I got saved at 14, but I didn't really live for God until I was 19, until I had this encounter where it wasn't really flashy. I just went to three different places where they all started speaking in tongues. And I was like, what's going on, God? This is not of you. And I don't know what's going on. And I put my head in between my legs and I cried. And I was like, God, get me out of here. And it didn't happen. And, and um, so fast forward a little bit. I go to a Bible college that used to be here. And uh, <laughs> um, I go to the Bible college and... The Rachel Jenks worked there at the time, and I was like going from church to church and bouncing around from different denomination to different denomination and wondering where it was that I felt at home. And I remember the two things that she told me. <laughs> she said, you may not agree with everything. I was like, who says that out the gate? Like, who just tells you that there's going to be stuff you're not going to agree with? But it's family. And at that point, I got hooked because I said, family, what is that like? Because to me, growing up, my church experience was very much I went because I wanted friends or I, I went because it was the right thing to do. And I didn't feel family. And so keep fast forwarding. And as I told you, my first what, two years here, man. The people who are my age in the room, no, I was not, I was in and out. I went, came to church, I left. I came, I went away. I like literally, I would sit there, argue with that man over there in my head and go, what is he saying? I know it's in the Bible, but where? Like, and I would just, I would not want it. But the thing that connected me is I was starting to teach myself about the new creation. I was starting to teach myself that we are now the Ark of the Covenant. I was starting to teach myself about healing and the gifts, and I was, I was mulling over through scripture, and then that Sunday, he preaches a message that's almost identical to what I was listening to the night before, and I said, this, this can't be a coincidence. This has to be it. So I, I was kicking and screaming for two years, <laughs> yeah. and then all of a sudden, I realized that this was family, and... Sometimes we don't agree with family. Sometimes we don't even get along with everybody in our family, to be honest. But we're family. And that sent me on a, a journey that I didn't expect at all. Not at all. I was doing ministry stuff. Didn't tell anybody about it. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I was just doing it. Not because I was like, oh, I want to put this underneath my belt. because I was like, oh, that sounds like a fun time. And... Um, so I did, mini I did different ministry stuff, uh, one in North Carolina, one in South Dakota. And it was, it was then I, I started to realize what I had because there's people around me saying things about me that they wouldn't have known at all. They didn't know. They didn't know that I've spoken in front of people. They wouldn't know any of the ministry stuff I did that I didn't, that I found insignificant. They didn't know any of that. But yet they started to pull things out of me that I didn't know was in me until it started being pulled at. And October 
of 2017, I preached here for my first time with fear and trembling. <laughs> and <laughs> I realized that the gifts that we have on our lives are normal to us, but extraordinary to others. It's normal to us. It's normal. So if you can play an instrument, you can play it well, and you're in your room by yourself all the time, it's normal to you. And until you play it in front of someone, it's not going to be extraordinary to them. It's literally going to just be this like gift that you have. And so I had to come to this reconciliation of the gift that I had and my own introvertedness and my own personality and everything that was I thought was me, but realizing that it was just a preference that can go away at any time. <laughs> and I then started to be asked, uh, I got asked to do Young Adults here in 2017 when it's called Vision 2020. Whoop, rep. Um, I was asked to do basic in 20, fall of 2018 with also fear and trembling because I literally sat there and I was like, Blake and Free Neil were like, you wanna do basic? And in my soul, I said, no, no, run away. <laughs> but in my heart, I was like, eh, you know, might as well just go for it. <laughs> but I was having, there was, I, my first meeting at basic, I went there, prophesied over like three people. And I don't know, it just kind of like fell. And it's been like five and a half years now um, doing that. And, I, and then I was sent to White Sox. Um, to do the church plant down there, which was phenomenal, phenomenal. Very awesome people. Love Pastor Tim a lot. Learned a lot about him when you kind of just do ministry together. How silent that man is. <laughs> How kin spirit we are in our introvertedness. <laughs> How we can sit in a car and not talk. And it's the most beautiful thing in the world. <laughs> Wonderful. Magical. It's, it's, it's great. And, um, and then I did, then I did SOM and that was a, a leap for me because I was working full time at the time. And then I stopped working full time to do that. And I was called the guinea pig generation because I literally was the guinea pig. It was me and Katrina <laughs> and two students and just the most interesting thing I've ever experienced in my life. And I never thought I would, I would do that because when I was in Bible school, I wanted to stop Bible school and go to this ministry school down in Pennsylvania. Never did it. And so I was not even thinking about it in the back of my head. And then that came. So most of my Christian life, I never knew the need for his body. It was only me and Jesus. That's it. How no, to matter, like the degree of relationship between Jesus and I, like that might have been rocky and up and down and all that other stuff, but I never knew the need for his body until I came here because his body is the manifestation of the man, Christ Jesus, in the earth. And I was listening to a minister once and he's like, isn't it interesting that they don't call it the body of Jesus? They call it the body of Christ. Because Jesus has a body. <laughs> we're the body of the anointed seed. It's it's we're the we're the we're the we're the manifest sharers and partakers of his divine nature. Jesus said in John 13, it's better for you that I go away. Which I don't know, I'd probably yell. Be like like Peter, be like, no, don't go away. My life is so much better when you're here, like, you know, but it's better for you that I go away so I can send the spirit of my father. And so the body of Christ became real to me. There was people in this room and you know who you are that have definitely impacted my life and, and have spoken to me and encouraged my gifting and, and all that other stuff. And it's not just about that, but encouraged me not only to the increase of my gifting, but my whole being. And so because of that, it was more than just me and Jesus. It was me, Jesus, and his body. And that's hard. That's hard to do because when you start to relate to family, 
you start to realize that the family you grew up with could be a microcosm of the family you have in church. And if they're one and the same, bless God, but, but like normally they're not. And so I just learned that his body is, is so vital. And to those of you have, that have been hurt by his body, I'm sorry. Because all of us are in a family and all of us make mistakes and all of us misrepresent all the time. And it's, and it's, that's why, you know, Ava kind of said it well, we have to forgive each other. We have to move forward. We have to, it's not water underneath the bridge. It's the blood that covers a multitude of sins. It's not just like, all right, we're just going to throw it under there and just never talk about it again. No, it's, it's, it's his spirit and it's life and it's his blood covering, it's love washing over a multitude of sins. There is no way, absolutely no way there's some things people can forgive today without Jesus. There's no way. There's no way. Absolutely no way we could do it without the spirit of God. And, and we need a healthy connection with not only Jesus, but his body. We need to know that his body is multifaceted. We need to know that his body is multicolored. <laughs> we need to know his body is diverse and has many different things and many different gifts and things that you might not have seen before, but is his body regardless of whether or not we agree. And so my life just seems to keep painting that picture because the amount of people that have went through my life and stayed there is because I don't agree with them on everything. They don't agree with me, but yet the body stays together. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says, So then those who received his word, this is Acts 2, the Holy Spirit fell. Peter gets up on the day of Pentecost, says, This is, we're not drunk as you suppose. This is the fulfillment of in the last days. So he's talking about the fulfillment, and he quotes Joel, and it says, I'll pour of my spirit upon all flesh. And then he goes, You repent. Change your mind, be baptized, be immersed into Jesus Christ, and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says that those who received his word were baptized because they had to be baptized out of Moses. And that day they were added about 3,000 souls. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if you read Acts chapter 2, there's a bunch of people from a different place everywhere on the day of Pentecost. There was different colors. There was different this and that and the other thing. You don't think that out of the 3,000 souls they ever argued? Like, you don't think that there wasn't somebody there with some hate in their heart towards somebody else? You don't think that the 3,000 souls, everybody was happy, clappy, we love Jesus? No. It was probably a bunch of ironing, sharpening iron in the wrong way, <laughs> from the wrong angle. It was, it was probably a bunch of, oh, I don't know what just happened to me, but we're here. And so 3,000 souls were added. Verse 42 says, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And I think it's intriguing to me that they went through doctrine, fellowship, which is different than breaking of bread. So that tells me that just because food's not involved does not mean that we're not in fellowship. Um, because it's separate, and prayer. So the 3,000 souls added to the church that day, the diversity of people that were there on the day of Pentecost, all proselyting Jews, meaning that they all converted to Judaism, now were added to the church. And I could just see the mass chaos in the text. I, to me, I'm just like sitting there going, oh my goodness, imagine in this body if we added 3,000. Oh. <laughs> You know, like, think, think about it. Imagine if we added 3,000 here. Imagine. There would be people over here, this, you'd probably hear about this, quarreling, this, that, and the other thing. But they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship with each other, to the breaking of bread, which is covenant, and to prayer. That's his body. That's, he was, they, add, they were added, so... That just because the Bible doesn't talk about like their conflict does not tell me that there was something new under the sun and they were just superhuman and we're not. Like I'm pretty sure there was conflict. Yeah, that's 
I mean, Acts chapter 15 shows that. Like Peter, Paul and Peter were like, I don't agree with you. You don't agree with me. Shut up and sit down. Like, like, and Paul was just like, no, you're wrong. Oh, okay. The body of Christ is more necessary than you would put stock in. His body is the most vital thing for growth, for longevity, And so that way we can grow not only in our gifting and our calling, but as a whole person, as as in our character and how we walk and our preferences and stuff like that. The body is so necessary right now that people are going to church. I did this. I went to church because it seemed like the good thing to do. I talked to a few people because they came up to me and I wanted to run away. (laughs) But I didn't have connection with any of them. I didn't have friendship with any of them. We didn't laugh about anything. We didn't eat, like, we didn't eat together. We didn't do anything. And it's a two-way street. Part of it was me. Part of it was them. And so the body of Christ is, is a connected living organism. It's, it's, it's a thing that we mature together. That's why the, in Romans 12 it says, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Why? Because when you're sad, I get to be sad with you. Not, I don't have to be sad in myself. I could just be sad with you. When you're rejoicing about something, you don't need me to be like, oh, oh why is his life so much better? No, I, I need to clap my hands and say, good job. That's great. You got this. You, you overcame that. It's, it's the body of Christ that we need to get back to. And healthy body means healthy sons. That's how it is. And um, we're going we're gonna to read some word. Hold on. So 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the gifts of the Spirit. But in verse 4, it says, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are a vi- variety of ministries in the same Lord. There's a variety of effects, but the same God who works all, thing, all things in all. But to each one, he gave the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So what does that tell me? My gift's not for me. <laughs> my gift's not for me and your gift's not for you it's for each other actually it says it's for the common good which means it's for the unbeliever too it's, 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 for, it's for that person that you're like oh God gave me a word for them but oh, their leg's broken but oh, I could share Jesus with them but like it's, it's, it's for the common good which means God has all, always been about all people. He's always been about every single ethnic pe- person on the earth. He's never, he's always been about us manifest, manifest, yeah, manifest, nope, that's, that's not happening. <laughs> he's always been about our gifts for the common good. Now, the world knows this very well because that's what they do, but they do it for money, they do it for greed. For the, we do it because freely we've received, so freely give. And so sometimes I have to get out of myself <laughs> and go, no, no, their leg's broken. All right, I'm going to go over there. It's going to be really awkward. I did this at the Bible college, by the way, um, with people who didn't agree with me at all. I sat there. Um, a girl heard herself during basketball practice. And during the time, I was hearing everything everything. I was feeling people's pain. I was, it it was all the time. And so one of my friends at the time was like, go pray for them. I was like, no, it's weird. What will they think? What will they do? And they were like, go pray. So I went, I prayed with much fear and trembling because it says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And I put my hand on both of her knees. Her knees went hot, cold, it popped both and all the pain left. And I sat there and I was like, what? <laughs> What's going on? What, who, who am I? I felt like an Avenger. Like I was sitting there, I was like. <sighs> <clears throat> if you know, you know. Um, and I just didn't understand. I didn't understand that 
This is what the body does. So even if someone disagrees with you, it's okay. It's fine. Most of the time, the people who disagree with us about the gifts of the Spirit come to us when in dire need. Happens every single time. They're like, so you believe in healing. Somebody said this to me once. They were like, you believe in healing, and I don't. So can you pray? And I was like, <laughs> I almost wanted to go, same God? Or we, we, did he change? Like, in the Old Testament, it's the Lord who heals you. Like, what, what is, what's going on here that we, we, but because we've, we've theorized everything, we've, we've, we've made it into, it was good for them because they didn't have technology, because they didn't have modern stuff, because they didn't have this, they were in the first century, they had, they did bloodletting, they did all this other stuff, so they needed healing, oh, we're not in Africa, we're not in a third world country, so therefore we have medicine, so let's do that, but I, I've learned something about God, he's a both and person, he's both, it's, it's always both. To me, I, I look at stuff, and we like to go in extremes, but he just seems to be in the middle, and he likes to mess with our, like, it must be this or this. And he's like, well, what about the middle? What about the tension of the both end? What about the fact that you can take medicine, but I can still heal you in an instant? We can, we can pray and watch the pain go down, or you can just go stretch. Like, it's, it's both and. It's not either or. It's, it's available. And that's, that's why I think that, <laughs> that's why I think it's, it's, that's why when people talk about healing, it's always hard for me because it's what's available. Whether, whether it works or not, I always have to tell myself, it's available now. Like, there's things that are available that we don't need to pray for. There's things that are available that we don't need to fast, pray, beg, and plead for. It's available through the transfusion of the blood of Jesus Christ. He didn't just cover you so that way God the Father can look at you through rose-colored glasses. He transfused himself inside of you so that way you can look like he did in the beginning. So that way the garden can now come back into view and you can be in the garden with God again, so that way we don't have to be far away. We don't have to be cast out. He did, his blood, it says, behold the Lamb of God, the Lamb, not the Lion, the Lamb, love Pastor Terry Ross, the Lamb who removes the sin of the world, the sin, not sins, the sin, the major thing, the, the thing, the mark that was being missed, he came to remove and so that way we can be reconnected or reawakened again to his body. We've always been, he's always been near. He's always not been far. He's always been close, not far away. And yet, in Colossians it says we were alienated once in our minds. In our mind. We thought we were far. That doesn't mean we were. Because then God couldn't be in Christ. Reconciling the world to himself. Whew. All right, we're going to read more. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, this is 11 through 22, but you'll be okay. But the, that one and very same spirit works all, the, all these, dividing to each one individually as he wills. For as, the, for as the body is one and has many parts, and all the many parts of that one body, one body are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Gentile, praise God, whether slave or free, whether we have all, all been made to drink of one spirit. The body is not one part, but many. If the foot says, I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear says, and Paul keeps going down, talks about different analogies about the body. And I realized sooner or later that we just have to be, we have to know our body. Like we have to know why we're in the body. We do. We have to, and then we operate in that. And I think that's what gives a lot of, takes the pressure off of everyone trying to do everything yeah. at all times. And that's why the one man show is very hard. I've met many pastors that, man, I would be depressed too. Like, like, whoo, imagine, 
everything being put on your shoulders all the time, asking this, like not asking anyone because you think it's your job. And yes, I think there is, I think there's probably time for that. But he's made the body to operate, and we have to trust in that said body <laughs> to do it. <laughs> and that's what's hard. We have to trust in his body to do the giftings that they were gifted to do. It's his body, not ours. It's, it's his idea, not ours. The church is, is a collection of his body, and we have to, it's the Israel of God. It's the, it's the, it's the thing, it's the living organism that he manifested through himself. He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my blood. Jesus made a covenant with the Father and said, join in. So that way we could be co-heirs, co-joined to him. So that way this covenant that we're in doesn't mean that we have to do everything. It's we just have to trust in his body. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says, And coming to him as a living stone, as to a living stone, which was rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It's acceptable to God. And what's interesting to me is that the nation of Israel in Exodus was told to come up the mountain because God wanted to make a kingdom of priests and sons. He wanted to make the nation of Israel be with them, but they got scared of God. And so they were like, Moses, you go do it. But Jesus made us a kingdom of priests and kings with him being the chief cornerstone, with him being the head. And we're being built up, not just us, everyone. The global body of Christ is being built up into the spiritual house that's acceptable to God. And that's what he's doing. He's, he's showing us the acceptableness of what's already there. He's, he's realizing that our, we've been so transformed on the inside that we just have to, we have to believe it. And that's where my life has been, is God's trying to get me all the time <laughs> to believe, <laughs> to trust, to do the thing that he's called me to do. And it's hard. <laughs> Because what it does is it takes humility, not making, kicking myself on the ground, but being humble enough to say, God, no, you know the end from the beginning. You know outside of time what I'll be. And you will say this at the right moment, and I have to believe. And that's hard. That's hard, church. That's, that's really difficult because that means that whatever defects, whatever weakness inside of us, he speaks contrary to that. And when he does, you're like, <laughs> like, it's intriguing to me that a lot of ministers that I know are introverted. It's crazy to me. Crazy. A lot of them I know are introverted. They don't want to talk to nobody. But yet God stirs something on the inside of them that says, I must preach the gospel of the kingdom. It, it, it's, it's something that, like, it's, he's in all. He's in all, which means sometimes I can hear somebody talk and they can be in error and I know they're in error, but I can hear the kingdom because if you have the spirit to hear, let them hear. So then what you, what you do is you hear through the spirit to that person and you speak in that, that, that glimpse of eternity that's in their heart that they can see the kingdom in some facet even if the rest of it's wrong. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Another thing I always thought was intriguing was we quote this a lot in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. It says, we have the mind of Christ, not I. We. So collectively, the, the parts of the mind of Christ, we have it together. Galatians chapter 6, don't let, let we not be weary in doing good. We, because he's seeing it as a body. He's seeing things that 
we, we don't. And also, the Bible was written in a culture where they thought communally. In America, we think individualistically. We go to a restaurant and we're like, mine, that's mine, this is mine, I'm getting my own plate. In every other expression of, in the world, they think communally. Literally, it's like, okay, so I'm going to get some of that. You're going to get some of that. We're going to have this. In different countries, I, I was, I've read that like people just open up their house to whoever. Just because. We have to get back there where it's a we thing, not an I. It's we together will do this. We will have, we will have dominion. We will see the hope come to Binghamton together. And what that means is, is that there's different tribes that are in the triple cities that we need to we with. <laughs> it's great, right? I know. I know. I know. The things you think about and then you're like, oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. We need to be together with them. Why? Because there's only things we can do together that we can't do separate. There's only an expression that they have and we have that needs to mingle together in the pot. Like it's just, it's just how it is. The church is the idea of the Father and the body of Christ is how we're going to be redemptive salt and light. It's time to redeem. In Romans 8, it says the world is waiting for Jesus. No, the world is waiting for for the sons of God to manifest. The travailing of the earth is waiting not for Jesus to get back here, but to, to have his body expressed through the earth so the redemptive power that came out during the, the resurrection can now start to spray itself all over the earth. I don't even mean people. I mean creation. I mean the rivers, the sea, the, the everything, the forest. The kingdom of God, he, he came to, to get the whole universe. He came to restore the universe and the things we can't see. It's amazing to me. It's amazing to me that God was in Christ thinking, I'm going to redeem the whole universe. Even though he's going to redeem his innocence, his image, and his likeness, in, his, in humans, I'm going to redeem the whole cosmos, the whole thing. And we need to realize that unless we do it, there's no way. Jesus finished the work. And when he died on the cross, you see that the veil was supernaturally torn, torn which means God's can finally come out. <laughs> The veil was trying to hide his glory. Only high priests that were clean could go in it. But when the veil was torn, it meant that now God's going to come out and invade the earth that is his. Because the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. That he gave the earth to the children of men. That it's time for the body of Christ to rise up and not wait for someone better. But realize that he's given us the spirit to do all things. He's done, he's done it. He's doing it, and he'll continue to do it. The kingdom of God has grown, will grow, and continue to grow. Even if you don't see it today, the body of Christ is growing. And if you talk to anyone who's, who's across the, the sea <laughs> in the Eastern world, they see the explosion. Every single time I hear about things from China, third world countries, it's exploding. The gospel of the kingdom cannot and will not be stopped. So his body is the conduit for his glory no longer to be in a temple somewhere off in Jerusalem. But it's he's been moved into temples made without hands. He's not going to go back into a, a, a little ark of the covenant and say, I'm going to sit here and when I get dropped on the ground, everybody else is going to die. <laughs> Fun fact, look, look it up. He's saying, I have now cleaned the inside of the cup. He's done something. He's cleaned us to the uttermost. So that way we can be effective in the body of Christ. So body, this is what I'm encouraging you to do. Realize that you're important. You're not here as, an, as a mistake. 
You don't have to be behind the microphone like I am, even though, trust me, 10 years ago, I didn't want to be. <laughs> you think I wanted this. <laughs> I didn't at all. He, he needs you to do what you do. And he needs his spirit to infuse inside of it. So that way creativeness, that way his creative nature can flow through you and upon you. So that way we can see things we've never seen in, in Binghamton. Yeah. We own net businesses we've never heard of because people get in front of God and say, well, here it is. There it is. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be sacred or secular. It's both. He's in all and through all and above all. He's not waiting for us to just get in a good, perfect space. He's waiting for the mobilization of his church to realize that the spirit it says in Acts chapter 2 that the spirit fell upon them. Another, trans, another translation, or in the Greek, it can say, come close to. So it, the spirit literally came up and, and came up close to them, and they got overwhelmed that they started to prophesy and speak in tongues. So what is it going to take, church, for all of us to finally believe that he paid for a spotless bride? Yeah. He prayed for his body to be mobilized on the earth. And what that looks like? You can figure out <laughs> what it looks like. He'll show you what it sounds like. He'll show you what it seems like, what the, the amount of people that you might influence. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. So even if you only influence your kids and two people your whole life, that's enough. It's enough. It's enough. It is enough. If you did everything he told you to do, and the only people you influence are your kids and your best friend and another friend that you made, it's enough. Why? Because you did what you needed to do. You did what he told you to do. You expressed his image and likeness through you. So it's not about numbers. It's about what he told you to do. And it's about doing it. And man, that is a loaded so much. <laughs> but it's time for the body in this body, in this tribe, to know that if I stayed, <laughs> if you've been caught by the revelation, it's over, man. <laughs> it's it's going to keep itching away. And even if you're not with our tribe and you go to a different one, it's okay. We'll say hi to you. It won't be this like awkward thing where we walk through the mall and we're like, oh my gosh, did you see that? They, are you okay? Like, are we going to talk to them? No, <laughs> because we've been set free from this, this thing that says, oh, they don't go to our church. So that means, no, we are the body of Christ. We are the manifest presence of him on the earth. And we need each other. So that way we can advance the kingdom. Yeah, I agree. So that way we can see his goodness in the land of the living. And it's not, it's his goodness all over the world that's manifesting right now. We can't see it. Oh my goodness. I bet right now someone's probably getting filled with the spirit and getting saved. But we don't know. We only know what we flip to or what we look at or what we click on. It, it's the kingdom of God that Paul said was already in the whole world, in that known world, and bearing fruits in Colossians 1. It's, it was already bearing fruit. So how much more now? How much more did the king, is the kingdom even advancing even now in the year 2024? How much more? How much more? We, we look and we're like, oh, much more. I, think, I think it was Pastor Eve that was like, if you look through history, we really don't have it that bad. <laughs> and it's true. it's true. We don't. We live, oh, man, I just, oh, we're 5% of the world's population, but yet we live the richest and more than kings 400 years ago and we wonder why and then we're like oh this thing oh this 
And yet we send money for a borehole in Africa because they don't have running water, but all they have is the spirit of their father inside of them that's thankful for water. And sometimes even I have to tell myself to be quiet, that I have clean water. It's okay. Uh -huh. I have food. There's people, and it's not meaning to like, it's not meaning to make you feel bad. It's meaning to say that he's in all contexts. He's here with you right now, as much as he's here with the people in Africa, as much as he's here with people who are 10 times richer than us, as much as he's here with the people who are poorer than us. God is so multifaceted that he can be with all people at all times. But we are the hope of, in the light of the world. And by, I know this is kind of a not nice word here, but Christianity in man's eyes is a religion. Calm down. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> if you're wondering what we mean by religion, it's man's attempt to try to do what Jesus has already done. That's, yes. that's it. We're religion, yes, but we're a living organism that tries to express the nature of our Father in the best way possible. And we need to forgive each other because we're going to get it wrong. We're going to see wrong. We're going to somewhere along the line we heard correctly and then went right, left. But it's about his body. And it's about what he's done with me is he taught me that his body is important and that it's necessary. And if it's just you and Jesus right now, you got to welcome his body. You got to, because it can't just be you and Jesus. It, it's, it's a lovely thing. I bet you probably have the greatest times, but his body needs you. His body needs you as much as you need the body. It's, it's how he... It's how he set it up. <laughs> it's, there's so many people that are so hurt. But what I love about our tribe is that we express his body. I'm going to read a prayer and then we'll, I'll be done. Wow, time really runs fast. It was 40 minutes. Um, I'm going to read a prayer from Ephesians chapter 3. I just want to encourage you, everybody, to close your eyes and just kind of imagine this prayer with me that Paul writes. It says, for this reason, I bend my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints <laughs> what is the width and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you might be filled to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you that we get to be part of your family. That you adopted us as full sons. That you adopted us not waiting for the inheritance, but the inheritance has already come. And we just thank you, God, for the body, and we bless it now. We bless every tribe of your body. And we say, come to wholeness. We, we thank you, God, that we have something somebody else needs, and they have something that we need. And I just thank you for the journey that you've been with me through. In Jesus' name, amen.